Good evening and welcome to Driver's Ed. Hopefully everybody had a great evening or a great day. Uh, it seems uh, pretty light out, so I guess I'm rushing nighttime. But here we are uh, into our basically second week, um, even though we had two classes last week. Kind of covers for the first week where we were missing one class so slowly but surely we're moving along tonight's class um, dealing with sign signals pavement um, markings one of my favorite classes so welcome welcome make sure you sign in oh I forgot to move my mic There, hopefully people can hear me now. I forgot that I didn't have my mic in front of me. I was just doing some work. Um, we're gonna make sure that just about everybody's here before we get going. Yeah, we've got just about um, just about everybody here um, signing in under comments it looks like added to the broadcast but I don't see the the eyes so we're gonna find out who is actually still with us and just not signing in and signing out so I'm gonna kind of get out of the music here for a minute so just bear with me okay I told you last night that I was going to Put something on our Facebook page that I want you to download to do to do for tonight's class but I changed my mind this morning um, because one of the problems that I always have with all these online classes and is really trying to find out who is actually here who is still participating I know you're putting some comments uh, and that's helpful I get to see that but what we're going to do we're going to do a sign quiz that I'm gonna put a sign quiz on the screen and you're gonna be given uh, probably about five minutes to do, all right? Now I think, I'm gonna see if I can get a, um, a timer. I'm gonna see if I can find a timer. No, that's not gonna work. All right, so get out a blank piece of paper and hopefully you've got something to write with. What the quiz is, is 30 signs. Now, all the answers are there. You, It's a matching. It's a matching quiz. So, like I said, I'm going to give you uh, five minutes. Actually, I could um, do it with my phone. So, I'm going to do that. So, let me just kind of get into my timer so we can do that. Timer. And let's do... Five minutes. There it is. And I'm going to put it on the board. So here you go. There it is. 30 meanings that go to those signs. So you're matching. All right. So on your piece of paper, go from one down to 30 and match the meaning to the shape. I'll put this over here. See if you can see it. At the end of the five minutes, uh, take a picture of your answers so I know that you're doing this.
Roughly two minutes and 40 seconds left. If you're having a hard time, I'll, I'll help you out. 23 is A. Down to the home stretch, almost 30 seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. That is it. Okay, time is up. Okay, so what I want you to do is to take a picture of your answers and send it to me. So text it. So, so text all the answers that you have from this quiz. So I'm going to wait till people send it in. So take a picture. I'm going to get out of this for just a little bit. So send in a text, text in a picture that you've done it. You remember I talked about last week that the state is going to ask you 10 sign questions. So it's really important that you have a basic understanding of signs. And the hard thing that most people don't realize is that we know that you can read. We know that you could be driving down the road and see a sign and read what's on it. But do you have enough sense? Do you know enough about driving that you can take a shape and a color and wording and match them together. And that's basically what we've done right here. So let's see who's been sending me in. Let's see how many people do we've got here. Oh, Sydney, you didn't do it right. Let's see how many other people. You had 30 questions, 30 should have 30 answers. So I'm kind of going through what people have done. Oh, most people got them all, all completed. All right. I want to show you something. 
that hopefully would have made this a little bit easier. How come some people um, some people aren't doing their uh, questions here? I don't see everybody. Evie, where's yours? Okay, there's, there's Kate's. Who else am I missing? I don't have Sophia. I don't see an answer sheet from, from you. All right. I'll be able to go through most of these later, later tonight. But I want to show you something. I want to put this back um, on the board so you take a look at it. If you take a look at the signs that you have, you got 30 possible. Let's see if I can come over here. You've got 30 possible meanings that go on these signs. If you took this quiz, and if you take a look at A, C, E, G, and I, they all, they all have one meaning. So once you use those signs, you don't use them ever again. If you take a look at D and F, orange means construction. So if the meaning had nothing to do with construction, you don't use those signs anymore. So after you've done all of that, the rest of the quiz was between two signs. B, which is yellow, which means warning. And H, which is white, which is a law. So the rest of the quiz was between those two signs. So what were they trying to show you? Was it a law or was it a warning? So I'm going to go through that. Oh, there's Sophie. Let's see if I can get into my phone here for a second. There we go. All right. People were doing it. That's good. So on the midterm, which will be coming up soon, you are going to have a heavy, heavy amount of signs. Since most of you seem to have done it, let me give you the answers real quick so we can kind of go from here, all right? So here's the answer key that I'm going to give to you. So, uh, oh, I'll put it back on the board so you can see it, and I'll move over. Okay, I'll move my mic over too. There we go. So hopefully you'll be able to hear it. Okay, 35 miles per hour, that is H, that is a law. Two, bump, that is a warning. That's usually telling you that something's up ahead and you should be going slower. Dead end is a warning, B, because you don't want to go down the road because you won't be able to go all the way through. Four, deals with construction, that is F. And the difference between F and D, D is a warning sign because it's a diamond. Uh, F is a guide sign, so it's guiding you to the detour. So five is a warning because it's got feet. So that's D. Six, divided highway ends is B. Do not enter. It's one of those signs that only has one meaning. That is G. Do not pass is H. Nine, end of construction. That is a guide. So that's F. Flagman, which has feet, that is D. 11, a warning of about a hill coming up, that is B. Left-hand turn, you'll see these at intersections, that is H. That's a white sign with a left arrow. No parking any time is H. No passing zone is C. 15, no turn on red is H. 16, no U-turn is H. 17, pass with care is H. 18, road machinery ahead is D. 19, road narrows is B. Slippery when wet is B. Soft shoulder is a warning is B. Speed limit, 35 is H. If you got 23 wrong, uh, you, you're beyond hope. 
24, stop ahead. B, warning. 25, stop for school bus. B, that's a warning. 26, stop here on red is H. 27 is truck route. That's H. And basically, uh, we have one of these signs in Dover near Red Shoe Barn because there's a train trussle and trucks can't go underneath that bridge. So uh, trucks aren't allowed in that road. So they have to take a side road. Uh, 28, two-way traffic is B. 29, wrong way is I. And 30 is E. So what I'd like you to do, not for uh, public hum humiliation, but uh, I want you to send me your score on your phone. Do not put it in the comments for YouTube because I do not want to public shame you. I will tell you I've been using this quiz for probably 20 years. And I will almost bet that most of you have at least 8, 10, 12 wrong. There are going to be some of you that have 15 wrong. Half of them you will have wrong. And that is normal because you've never really thought about signs the way that we're going to look at signs tonight. So please text me um, on your phone to what you got for a score. I could take a look at it anyways if I want to dig in really deep and correct all of them myself. I can do that later this weekend and see what you got for a score. But I'd kind of like to see who's um, doing their reading and has a basic understanding of shapes and colors and signs like that. So let's get right into the PowerPoint for tonight. So let's do signs, signals, and pavement markings. So the reason why we have signs, signals, and pavement markings is to make sense of the road that's up ahead. We basically, oh, there's going to be an echo. Let's get, get rid of that. All right. Hopefully there's no echo now. You need to make sense of the road ahead. If you take a look at the picture up above, and for those of you that are from Durham, you know this is right near the junior high. If you uh, drive with me your first time out driving, we actually go to this intersection within the first five to ten minutes that we drive uh, because it tells me a couple things. Uh, I will give you direction, but also it helps me know whether you're looking at your pavement markings so we know that we're in a lane that can go straight or turn right. And we have a stop sign. And we have a sign under the stop sign that says four-way. So there's bits of information that I, I get to see whether you're processing. Now, of all the different colors, so let's get this right out on the table. Please write this down. This is going to be for your midterm. There are only seven colors when it comes to traffic signs. Seven colors. Now, there may be some subcategories within those colors, but there are only seven. Of the seven colors, which color do you think is the most important? If you think it's red, then you are correct. Well, there's the test. So here's a whole lot of information. So we have red on a sign, so that's really important. But a lot of times there's so much information on the sign that we can't read it fast enough as we drive. Okay, and we'll get back to what all this information is talking about because it's got time of day, it's got um, day of the month, it's got stuff about parking, about towing. So you're really taking in a lot of information right from this particular sign. So in your notes, what I want you to write down, all signs can be broken up into four categories. Color, like we said, there are seven colors. Shapes, I haven't even counted how many shapes we have, but I'm going to guess that there are probably at least 15 to 20 shapes that you should be familiar with. Regulatory, so write this down in your notes. Regulatory means law. And then the last category is warning. Warning are good. Warning signs are good to, to help you out, but it doesn't necessarily mean that what it's warning you about is actually happening. Let's just use deer crossing. Okay, it's warning you that there have been deer that have been hit on this stretch of uh, roadway, but there's a good chance that you're not going to hit a deer. You're not going to even see a deer. 
But when it comes to regulatory signs, if it says 35 miles per hour and you're going 48, there's a good chance if there's an officer around, you're going to get pulled over. That law is constant. You always have to go that speed. So I would say be more aware of your regulatory signs than of your warning signs, although I still believe warning signs are very important. So as I stated earlier, red is the most important color that we have out there. Red is telling us not to do something. So prohibition means don't do it. It's prohibited. The bottom uh, picture has two signs of an off-ramp. If you miss the first sign, you better know the second sign is telling you the same information. Don't enter because you're going the wrong way. Now, the picture up above of the stop sign, I want you to get two things from this picture. Why do we have stop signs and stop lines that are not closely aligned? So if I'm in this situation, where do I stop? Do I stop at the sign or do I stop at the line? So in your notes, you always stop at the line. They could have painted the line right next to the stop sign. The only reason why that sign is in that position, it's because it's like a half circle right there. And if they put it closer to the line, people wouldn't see it because it, it, you're coming around a corner. They don't show you, but that's a corner. You're coming around a very sharp corner. So you get to see the sign a little bit earlier. And if you don't have a line, then always stop at the sign. Think about this. What do you do in the wintertime when it's snowing? You can't see any lines on the road. Can't see the center line. Can't see the edge line. Can't see your stop line. Always stop early and always stop at the sign and then move up. And know that you have to come to a complete stop. That's that pitch that we talked about last night. You're feeling the car going forward and then coming back. You're coming to that resting stop. So what is the difference between a rolling stop and a resting stop? So a rolling stop is where the tires are in continuous motion. They never feel the pitch. And I don't have the video. I don't think, I, I know I don't have the video. Um, but I have a video that correlates with this slide right here. That a lot of people, and write this down, most people will roll through a stop sign if they're making a right-hand turn or going straight. Very rarely will people make a rolling stop going left. Most people will look for traffic as they approach the stop sign. If they see no traffic is going or coming, they're going to go. The tires are in constant motion. There is never a resting stop. It's never to the point where the car is not moving. It is always in motion. Now this is a picture close to my home. Uh, there's a crosswalk right here. Um, the stop line is just up there to the left a little bit of, in the picture. And a lot of people, because of that bush uh, and the fence, that they're looking for traffic over near that brick building. They see no traffic is coming, and they roll right through, and they almost hit pedestrians almost on a weekly basis. Very dangerous intersection of where I live for pedestrians. I used to tell my kids, do not use that crosswalk. Go further down the road, about 400 feet. 500 feet and use the second crosswalk. Do not use this crosswalk. Very dangerous. So here's another, this is the picture that we started with. Uh, your stop lines, make sure that as you approach that you try to stop just slightly before the stop line. I've driven with a few of you. Uh, one of the constant problems for new drivers is you try to be perfect and you go beyond the stop line. I cannot tell you enough that the state wants the front bumper at the line. They don't want it overhanging. Don't think about your tires stopping at the line. It is your bumper. Your front of your vehicle has to be at the line, not overhanging. Now, let me just get out of here for a second and explain two things. Once you stop at the line, you have done what we call a legal stop. So write that down. The, the car has pitched. Okay, you've done your legal stop. You've done your requirement. But as we said 
last night, peripheral vision, we can't see. Our line of sight is bad. We talked about the environment. We talked about weather. You don't stay there and, and hope that you're going to see better. You've got to make yourself see better. So that means you've got to go forward a little bit. You've got to inch forward. And when you inch forward and stop again, we call that a safety stop. Okay, you may have to make one safety stop, maybe two. And the other thing is if you can't see, remember, lean forward, lean forward, and that's going to open up that peripheral vision. It won't put your front end out where it's interfering with other traffic out on the road. But stop lines can be very, very difficult. Um, I just had someone from a prior class just text me tonight prior to teaching uh, tonight. And he just got, it's the principal's son. I think most of you know the principal's son. He just got his license today. Okay. And I, I am telling you, and I didn't ask him, but I'm telling you, I know for a fact that they, they judge you harshly on how you stop. So if there's anything that you really want to work on, it's how easy you're stopping and um, stopping at the line on your driving test. Nothing shows them that you have control of your vehicle more than the way that you stop. Okay, next color, white. Now, most of you think of white as speed limit signs. Yeah, speed limit is probably the most common white sign that we have out there, but there are three subcategories. If you want to uh, test your parents tonight, or if they're around the house where you're watching this, whatever, ask your parents how many uh, different types of white signs are there. See what their answer is. They're probably going to look at you like, what are you talking about? But even your parents probably have never really thought about this. But your white signs are going to have three different colors on them. So if there's three different colors, that means there's three separate categories. So a white sign with black is telling you to do something like a speed limit. Okay, so white with black is telling you to do something. White with red is telling you not to do something. It's still a law, like no parking. You can't park there. You're going to get towed. White with green is guiding you to what is legal and what is not legal. So during the day, you can park for an hour, Monday through Friday, perfectly legal. You park Monday through Friday for three hours, you're going to get your car towed. You can park on Saturday because it's not Monday through Friday. You can park on Saturday and Sunday all day. So you need to read your signs and know what it's trying to communicate to you. So white has three subcategories, black, red, and green. Now, blue means motorist services. The most common one is handicap signs. We see them at all public buildings. We see them at all retail stores. We must keep that area free for people that have a handicap placard. But the other blue signs are more common not so much in the city or rural area, but on a highway. And in like this picture here, we actually have like four or five different services that are being provided at the next couple exits. So we've got gas, we've got lodging, we've got camping, we've got food, we've got telephone, we've got gas. So it does give us helpful information. Now, the nice thing about having GPS in your vehicle and having your cell phone with you now you have all this information right at your fingertip. But you've got to remember, you're not looking for services while you're moving. It's illegal to be looking on your phone. Have somebody else do it. But as a driver, you cannot be on your phone looking for the next gas station. The nice feature that I had on my driver's ed vehicle, I had to pay for the service. I don't have it anymore. But you could actually, on your GPS, just hit a button and it will tell you like eight gas stations in your area. And it will tell you how much they're charging for gas. And if you're low on fuel, if you just touch your GPS screen, it would actually go to a map to get you to that particular gas station if you didn't know how to get there. Pretty cool feature. I mean, that's high tech now. No one should be, you know, getting on a roadway and running out of gas if they've got that feature. Now, yellow is the most common type of sign that we have out there. There are so many 
different yellow signs. Now, there are two subcategories. General warning, which is your regular yellow, and then there's the neon crossing sign. So the bottom is the crossing. So when it's neon, it deals with pedestrians or schools. So it could be school crossing or pedestrian crossing or just a plain school sign. Now, remember, the school zone sign will always come before the school crossing sign. So they're trying to alert you to go at a lower speed. Once you see the school zone sign, drop your speed by 10 miles per hour. Write that down. That's going to be either tomorrow's class or Thursday's class. The speed limit by a school early in the morning, late afternoon, when they go into session or out of session, is 10 miles below the posted speed limit. So if you're going 30, go 20. If it's 40, go 30. But only those two times, morning and late afternoon. If we were in class, I'd actually go around the room and I have, I'd have all of you give me a yellow sign. Give me an example. It's really cool when I get a class close to 30 and hear are all the different signs that people can come up with. I mean, there are so many, so many. So here's your school zones, and there's the time. See, 8.15 to 9 o'clock, and then 2.45 to 3.30, and this is by Mohammed. So there's your neon, and actually near Mohammed, we actually have the flashing lights. So Townhouse Road has the sign to the left. 108 has, or 155, excuse me, has the sign to the right. Green signs deals with direction or guidance, usually found on a highway or in the city with street signs. And by the way, most people think that the street name, like the high school is on Code Drive. Code Drive is a green sign. But I want you to realize in other states and other areas of New Hampshire, they can be other colors. So still look for a sign at the end of a roadway that can tell you a name. I believe the other colors you could have for street signs is green, blue, red, and brown. I think brown has to do more with historical. Um, blue and red, I'm not too sure how they designate that. But I do know that um, you can find street signs in those colors. thought this was a pretty cool green sign. Uh, my nephew lives on the West Coast uh, over in Oregon. So if you were in Oregon and you wanted to go to Boston, you could get on uh, route number 20, heading east to Boston, and it's going to take you 3,365 miles. So you better um, plan on stopping at least for a couple of days because that's going to be uh, 30, or I mean interstate or uh, route 20 is not an interstate, so you're not going to get there very quickly. So it's going to be a long haul. Uh, brown is probably the least seen sign around. Brown means recreation. So Hilton Park, which is in Dover, near the substation, that's alerting you uh, to what's up ahead. And actually, it's got a whole lot of information here. We've got our green guide sign telling you the name of the road, Boston Harbor, and then you've got your motor vehicle, which is a service. Orange is construction. We see a lot of construction in the summer months. Once we start hitting um, the months of October, November, you probably aren't going to see as many of these. So be alerted to that. So the thing I want you to remember in your notes write down is that an orange sign, you probably, if you see construction workers or their trucks, start slowing down. The earlier you slow down for a construction area, the better off you're going to be. Traffic signals from top to bottom. Write this down. Red, yellow, green. Let's see it in the comments on YouTube. Someone put down why you think red is on top. And by the way, I put this picture in here for a reason. Is most people would say, oh, that's a yellow light. No, it's not. It's made to look like a yellow light because the camera didn't filter it correctly. That is still a red light. 
red is always on the top. When it's horizontal and not vertical, red is going to be on the left, then yellow in the middle and green to the right. So in some states, they don't go vertical, they go horizontal. So remember that. And I think you had that in responsible driving. So you would have seen that sign. The other dead giveaway about why that's a red light is that you have a countdown on the crosswalk. You cannot have a countdown and a green light. When the countdown is on, everybody, every roadway that is coming into that intersection has a red light to make safe passage for pedestrians. No one's answered the question, why is, why is red on top? Why do, why do you think red is on top? I'm going to let that go for a minute. How confusing is that sign? There we got an answer. That's another good one. Okay, the reason why colorblind people, so they know the location. I think Mina is probably the closest so far. And, and, and uh, so is uh, Gabriella. It is the most important and the one that you can see from the furthest distance. That is really the true essence of why it's on top. So good. I'm going to get out of here for a second and show you um, if, if, this is a, if this is a large truck, okay, and I'm following a large truck, the first thing that I see will be the red light. So when you're following a large vehicle, the first thing you see is the, the top light. So that's why it's the most important. You can see it from a further distance. So those are all good answers. So top notch. Good. Good. Someone sent this to me. And at first, you know, to be honest with you, I really thought it was real. It's, it's not real. But it's near a roadway. It's a public park, I believe, someplace in Europe. It's, it's really art. Why would they do that? Why would they put something near a roadway that looks like a traffic, uh, just all traffic lights? Um, but it is, it is really confusing. So uh, I, I didn't think that. Now, rather than go through this whole paragraph, let's talk about lights, okay? One of the most th common thing that I hear from parents is that they get nervous with their son or daughter driving is when they come to a traffic light that turns yellow. Should I make them go through? Should I make them stop? You know, it, I don't know if they can stop. They make me nervous. Okay, what I want you to write down, and here's the, the, the bottom line, the true essence of this whole paragraph. Traffic lights change accordingly to traffic flow. The lights have sensors under the pavement that can sense when there are vehicles going through the intersection. When not enough cars are going through the intersection, if someone's waiting left or right, it's going to switch over to the other two sides, left and right. When those groups of cars have gone, it senses there's no more, and then it goes back to the original main road. Okay, So there is a cabling system. It's all by magnetic, magnetic senses of the vehicle, and it lets you know what's going on. Now, I know this can get kind of technical, but I found this online. I thought it was pretty interesting. So I'm going to show you the, the video about uh, how they get traffic to go as groups. How do we get traffic times, especially with lights that are so close together? What's going on? Now, we talked about the HTS. We know engineers are spending a lot of time and money on building roadways because we want to get people to where they want to go safer and quickly. So here's a quick video about our roadway system. If you live in a major city, I can take a pretty good guess at one of your most common frustrations, traffic. In city driving, the journey is rarely better than the destination. In most cases, we just want to get where we're going. Traffic is not just frustrating, but it has consequences to the environment as well. All those idling vehicles have an impact on air quality. When you're stuck and sitting behind a long line of cars, it's easy to let your mind wander over solutions to our traffic woes. But traffic management in dense urban areas is an extremely complex problem with a host of conflicting goals and challenges. One of the most fundamental of those challenges happens at an intersection, where multiple streams of traffic, including vehicles, bikes, and pedestrians, 
need to safely and with any luck efficiently cross each other's paths. Over the years we've developed quite a few ways to manage this challenge of who gets to go and who gets to wait, from simple signs to roundabouts, but one of the most common ways we control the right-of-way at intersections is the traffic signal. I'm Grady and this is Public Works, my video series on infrastructure and the human-made world around us. This video is sponsored by Squarespace, more on that later. There are a lot of good analogies between cities and human anatomy, and roadways are no exception. Highways are like the aorta, with a high capacity and single major destination. Small collector roads are like the capillaries, with not much capacity but a connection to every individual house and business. And in between are the aptly named arterial roadways, the medium capacity connections between urban centers. Rather than ramps, overpasses, and access roads to control the flow of traffic, arterial roads use at-grade intersections through which only a few traffic streams can pass at a time. We call this interrupted traffic flow for obvious reasons. In most cases, these intersections are the limit to the maximum throughput of the roadway. In other words, increasing the number of lanes or speed limit won't have any effect on the overall capacity of the road. The only way to increase the number of vehicles that safely travel from point A to B is to increase the efficiency of the intersection. In addition, these intersections are where a vast majority of accidents occur. For these reasons, traffic engineers put a lot of thought and analysis into the design of intersections and how to make them as safe and efficient as possible. Controlling the flow of traffic through an intersection, otherwise known as assigning right-of-way, is an enormous challenge and almost always requires a compromise of numerous conflicting considerations, including space, cost, approach speed, cycle time, site distance, types and volumes of traffic, and human factors like habits, expectations, and reaction times. Intersections also need to be rigidly standardized so that when you come to an unfamiliar one, you already know your role in the careful and chaotic dance of vehicles and pedestrians. From a throughput standpoint, the ideal intersection would cause no interruption to flow whatsoever, but you can't put a high five interchange on every city block. On the other hand, simple signs are cost effective and don't require any extra space, but they can't handle a lot of volume because they create an interruption for every single vehicle passing through the intersection. You can see why traffic signals are so popular. They aren't a panacea for all traffic problems, but they do offer a very nice balance of the considerations we discussed before. Relatively low cost, minimal space requirements, and the ability to handle large volumes of traffic with only some interruption. In their simplest form, traffic signals are a set of three lights facing each lane of an intersection. When the light is green, that lane has the right of way to cross. When the light is red, they don't. The amber light warns that the signal is about to change from green to red. Beyond this basic function, traffic signals can take on innumerable complexities to accommodate all kinds of situations. Let's take a look at a typical intersection here in the U.S. to show how they work. At each approach to an intersection, there are three directions vehicles can go, called movements, right, through, or left. Right and through are usually grouped together as a single movement, so a typical four-way intersection has eight vehicle and four pedestrian movements. These movements can be grouped into phases of the traffic signal. For example, the left turn movements on opposite approaches can be grouped into a single phase because they can both go at the same time without conflicts. Traffic engineers use a ring and barrier diagram to sketch out how different phases of the signal are allowed to operate. Here's the ring and barrier diagram for our example intersection. The first phase is the major street left turns. Then the major street vehicle and pedestrian through movements. A barrier to clear the intersection the minor street left turns, the minor street vehicle and pedestrian through movements, and finally, another barrier before the cycle starts again. Hi, I'm Rex Moore with The Motley Fool in front of BMW's self-driving exhibit. There are an endless variety of phasing arrangements that traffic engineers use to accommodate various intersection configurations and traffic volumes for each movement. Even the simple decision of whether to use protected or unprotected left turns takes a significant amount of analysis and consideration. Another important decision is how long each sequence of a phase should last. Ideally, a green light should last at least long enough to clear the queue that built up during the red light. This isn't always possible, especially during peak times on busy intersections. 
In these cases where the intersection is saturated, the green light might be extended for each phase to minimize the startup and clearance times, which are periods when the intersection isn't being utilized to its maximum capacity. The amber light needs to last long enough for a driver to perceive the warning and decelerate their vehicle to a stop at a comfortable rate. One second for every 10 miles per hour or 16 kilometers per hour on the speed limit is a general rule of thumb. But traffic engineers also take into account the slope of the approach and other local considerations when setting the timing for yellow lights. In most places in North America, you're allowed to enter an intersection for the full duration of a yellow light, which means there needs to be a time when all phases have a red light to allow the intersection to clear. This clearance interval is usually about a second but can be adjusted up or down based on speed limit and intersection size. So far we've only been talking about signals on a set timing sequence, but most traffic signals these days are more sophisticated than that. Actuated signal control is the term we use for signals that can receive input from the outside and use that information to make decisions about light timing and sequence on the fly. These type of signals rely on data from traffic detection systems. These sensors can be embedded cameras or radars, but most commonly they are inductive loop sensors embedded into the road surface. They are essentially large metal detectors which simply measure whether or not a car or truck is present, sometimes to the annoyance of bicycle, scooters, and motorcycles that may be too small to trigger the loop. Whatever the type of sensor, they all feed data into an equipment cabinet located nearby. You've probably seen hundreds of these cabinets without realizing their purpose. Inside this cabinet is a traffic signal controller, essentially a simple computer that is programmed with specific logic to determine when and how long each light will last based on the information from the detectors. Actuated control gives a traffic signal much more flexibility to handle variations in traffic load. For example, if a nearby road is closed and traffic rerouted through a signal that doesn't normally see such high demand, it may need to be reprogrammed before the closure. A light equipped with actuated control will simply see the additional traffic and adjust its phasing accordingly. Same thing with special events like concerts and sports games that create huge traffic demands on irregular schedules, and even seasonal changes in traffic like in major tourist destinations. Actuated systems can also keep you from waiting at a long light when no one's crossing in the other direction. Finally, Actuated control can help by giving priority to emergency vehicles and public transportation by using specialized detectors like infrared or acoustic sensors that communicate directly with certain types of vehicles. But actuated control isn't the end of the complexity. After all, it still treats each intersection as an isolated entity, when in reality each signal is a component of a larger traffic network. And each component of the traffic network can have an impact, sometimes a major impact, on other components in the system. Take the classic example of two signals closely spaced in a row on a major roadway. If one signal gives a green but the next one doesn't, cars can back up. If they back up far enough, they can sit through multiple cycles at an intersection without being able to pass through until the light beyond clears. It's a frustrating experience for anyone. A signal is inadvertently but significantly reducing the capacity of an adjacent signal. One solution to this problem is signal coordination, where lights can not only consider the traffic waiting at their intersection, but also the status of nearby signals. This is a very common configuration on long corridors with relatively minor but frequent cross streets. The signals on the major road are timed so that a large group of vehicles, called a platoon by traffic engineers, can make it all the way through the corridor without interruption. This type of signal coordination can significantly increase the volume of traffic that can pass through intersections, but it really only works on stretches of road that don't have other sources of traffic interruptions, like driveways and businesses. If the platoon can't stick together, the benefits of coordinating signals mostly gets lost. The obvious next step in efficiency is coordination of most or all the signals within a traffic network. This is the job of Adaptive Signal Control Technologies, or ASCT. In adaptive systems, rather than individual groups of lights, all the information from detectors is fed into a centralized system that can use advanced algorithms like machine learning to optimize traffic flow throughout the city. These type of systems can dramatically reduce congestion, but they're only just starting to be implemented in major urban areas. As sensors become more ubiquitous and computing power increases, traffic management may slowly but surely be relegated from civil engineers to software developers and data scientists. On the complete opposite side of centralization, many believe that self-driving cars are the next revolution in traffic management. 
If every vehicle could communicate and coordinate with every other vehicle on the road, interrupted traffic control could eventually become a thing of the past. But don't get your hopes too high. In dense urban areas, traffic congestion is often self-limiting. Especially during peak times, for every one person on the road, there are many more at work or at home waiting for the congestion to clear up before they head out. This latent traffic demand means that any increase in capacity will quickly be filled up with more traffic, bringing the congestion back to the same level it was before. Katera was really formed because this industry... So hopefully this was useful for you. I, I, I really uh, thought this was really well done to explain uh, the movement of traffic. Um, because I think once you have a basic understanding of how lights work, you're not going to be confused about how lights are changing. Uh, when you when you start driving with me, you'll hear me say a lot, uh, watch traffic from the left to, to the right. The light is going to change. I'm trying to prompt you and, and guide you to learn how to gauge when lights are changing. It's going to give you an extra two to three seconds to make a decision on how you want to handle a yellow light depending on where you are when it turns yellow. And I think it will make you a better driver. So we'll practice that. Uh, in your notes, I want you to write down Opticom light. You probably can't see it, but the two lights that are hanging overhead on that pole, right in between those two lights, there's another little red light. And you can usually see them in all traffic lights in the Seacoast area. There's a little red light hanging up near the regular traffic signal, and that's called an Opticom light. That is used for emergency vehicles. So when you see that red light start to flash, that means somewhere in the area could be coming towards you to the left or the right or from behind that there's a police car, ambulance, or fire truck. So watch where they're coming from, and you may have to move off to the right to get out of its way. Uh, turning right on red, let's talk about that. It is legal in all 50 states when there is no sign telling you that you can't do it. Now, you're going to find these signs in various places. Now, let's just deal with the seacoast where we do most of our driving. I, there is not a sign in Durham. They don't have very many traffic lights. Dover has a few, no turn on red. Summersworth is by far the the town that I'm familiar with that has the most. Okay, they're all over the place in Summersworth. So if you're in Summersworth, don't just come up to a red light and think, oh, I can legally turn right on red. There's probably a sign that you're just not seeing. So look around, look next to the light, look across the intersection. It'll be posted somewhere to tell you. Now in some major cities like Washington, New York City, it's illegal to turn right on red because they've got to give the flow of movement. There's so much traffic as it is that they just they just ban it entirely. So just be aware that in the city, you're going to probably not be able to do it. But when you're in the suburban areas, it's going to be legal. All 50 states. You cannot turn, write this down, you cannot turn right on red when there is a countdown, so the number's counting down, or if there's a white symbol of a person walking. Those are two other situations. Even if there's no people crossing, if there are no people crossing and there's still a number counting down, legally you can't do it. So don't, don't get in the habit of saying, I can do it if there's no people around. No. you got to have this solid hand. Blinking hand, don't do it. Solid hand, no people, no cars, no traffic. It is legal. Now, also in your notes, when traffic lights don't work, treat it like a four-way stop or treat it like a stop sign. It may not be four-way. It could be three-way. It could be two-way. Now, at major intersections, police officers, when a, a light goes out, will probably come out to help. Why would a, a light go out? It could be winter where someone has gone off the road and hit a telephone pole and Electrical power is out. Could be an accident. Okay. He's going to over, uh, he, a police officer overrules signs and traffic lights. So always obey the police officer. 
when the light turns green, okay, we know that green means that you can go, but this is what I want you to write down in your notes because most people don't practice this. If you're the first vehicle going through, you should hesitate for a second, look to the left, look to the right, and then go through. So we're talking about like a half a second, check left, half a second, check right, just to make sure that you don't have any red light runners. If you're the first one through, there's a chance someone's still going through a yellow red light. As we saw in that last video, they talked about, and I think you should write this down. Hopefully you're read, writing down notes during some of these videos. But I, I thought it was great information that for every 10 miles per hour, it's probably going to be a second for the yellow light. So if the light uh, has a speed zone of 30, it's going to be a three second yellow light, and then it's going to hesitate for another second before the other side gets their green light. So you're going to have four seconds, basically, in a 30 mile an hour zone to get through that intersection. We basically just talked about that. Okay, this is a term or terminology that I want you to write down. It's called point of no return. It's, it's how I teach approaching traffic lights that are about to turn yellow. If you're going down a roadway and it's posted speed of 30 miles per hour, what I want you to do is find an object off on the side of the road, and let's just say it's a telephone pole. And you're saying to yourself, at going 30 miles per hour, if I get to that telephone pole, let's say it's about 120 feet from the, the stop line. If I get to that telephone pole and the light turns yellow, I'm going through. I'm not going to break. I'm not going to slow down. I may even go a little bit faster. We call that the point of no return. That is where you're making your decision. The problem with new drivers, the light turns yellow and they hesitate. I'll show you what they do. I'll get out of here. This happens with all my students. We're driving down the road. I'm the driver. The light turns yellow. They do this. Should I go? Should I stop? Now, while you're looking at me and asking, asking me, should I go? Should I stop? We're getting closer to the light, and we haven't made a decision yet. We're probably going to make the wrong one. Okay? The other thing, when you drive with me, please... Do not look at me and talk to me. If you talk right now, I'm looking at the, the camera. If I'm talking to the camera and there's someone sitting right next to me, they can hear me. I don't want you to take your eyes off the road, right? I will talk back to you so you can hear it. I know it's a sign of being polite when you look at somebody when you're talking, but when it comes to driving, please don't do that. Um, just that's on an aside, just a thing that I want to throw out there. Please don't do it. It's kind of scary. Uh, when you do decide to stop, you should know what's behind you because you can't say, oh, I've got plenty of time to stop when it first turns yellow. And the person behind you, they're thinking, oh, it's yellow. I'm going to go faster. They're going to hit you. Okay. You, you have to really know what's behind you if you're going to stop. And I will tell you, I'd rather have you go through just as it goes from yellow to red through an intersection with the car that's behind us. They're going to probably get hit more than you would uh, than to slam on the brakes and get hit from behind because then you're going to get pushed into the intersection and you still may get hit. All right. So this is something that I want you to practice. Um, I know I've driven with a few of you. Uh, I've driven with both of the Rileys. So, I, I, you know, and I drove with uh, Kate tonight. Uh, you know we're going through intersections, and there's always a chance that the uh, light is going to change. So we just want to practice that. Traffic with arrows. So let's kind of write this down. Anything that has a green arrow, and you heard this in the video, is called a protected turn, meaning that you're the only one that's legally able to go in that direction. The only other person that can go in that direction is someone that's turning right on red, but they are supposed to yield to you. Left-hand turns especially. Great to have arrows. So helpful. Can you turn left on a regular circle green light? Yes, but you have to yield to cars that are going straight. 
Some of my students still think green light, I can turn left regardless of where cars are coming from. No, you cannot. You've got to make sure that you do not interfere with the cars that are going straight. Red arrow on right still can turn right on red unless it's posted. Now, this is a Dover, and they've actually taken down that no turn on red arrow sign. So many people complained about it that the city decided, yep, it's probably still a safe thing to do. Let's, let's take it out. So they got rid of it. So at that intersection, if we ever get there, I'll try to point it out to you. You can legally turn right on red. Now, a red arrow turning left, you have to wait till a steady red arrow left turns green. Now here, if you want to trick up your parents, ask your parents, when can they turn left on a red light? Right? Tonight after class, ask your parents, when can you turn left on a red light? I will bet that all your parents will say never. You can. You can turn left. You can turn left on a, on a red light that's flashing. A flashing red light is like a stop sign. You stop, check, and then you can go when it's safe. All right, so I didn't say when can you turn left on a steady solid red light. I said when can you turn left on a red light. So it has to be blinking. That's the only time. Only time that you can do it. Uh, look around at traffic lights. You just never know what's going to happen. Now I'm going to show you a, a video of red light runners. I also want you to write down this term, write down photo enforcement. I think we've already heard that already in driver's ed on one of the videos that we, we had. But photo enforcement is where they put cameras. So right now this picture is from a camera. You can tell by the angle and how it's above traffic. It's showing cars that are going through the intersection. So I'm going to show you some red light runners. And I think... Um, oh, I forgot to show you the yellow one, but I'll, I'll, I'll go back. I'll talk about the, here, here's the yellow light. I was going to show you this. This is Durham. Let me show you this. Okay. So this is near the Whittemore Center and we're stopped in traffic behind motorcycles. You can see that the traffic light is up ahead and in a moment, the light is going to turn green and the flow of traffic is going to start to move. Now, Watch the speed of the motorcycles, the speed of the driver's ed vehicle, and watch the yellow light. Okay, so here we've got the green light. Everybody's moving. Now, as you're approaching the light, you've got to find a point. Let's see if I can find the point. Probably right about here. If it turns yellow, we're going through. See, yellow? It stayed yellow the whole time. The whole time that we went through. We never looked up and saw the light turning anything but yellow. That means you handled it right. Okay, we were beyond, we're beyond the point of no return. So here's um, the video on red light runners. We're gonna count down. I always like counting down. When the light turns red, I'm gonna count. Let's see how many seconds before, when, when they stop. One, two, three, three seconds, four. There was a second car. And by the way, that's a display stop line. That stop line to the left, different than the two lines to the right, that's called a, dis a display stop line. Okay, let's take a look at this one. One, one, two, three, four. Look at that. Guy had a green light, never checked and still barely made it through the intersection. So that was around four seconds. One, two, three. So like we saw in the video, it's not three seconds going through a yellow light. It's red and they're still going three seconds through it. This is so dangerous. One, two, three, four, and he splits the two cars. 
this is a mindset for people. This is something that, you know, they probably do on a regular basis. They pass this car. Watch this. The U-Haul just goes around the vehicle right through the red light. Didn't want to hit the car. Didn't want to hit the car. Went right around. Here's a, one of my favorites. One, two, three, four, five, six. And he sees bigger trucks than he is. And he goes, I'm going to lose that battle. I better stop and change direction. That's like five or six seconds. Think he's a little distracted, not paying attention. Then he looks up, finds out it's red. Now they're going to get a little bit worse. Okay. Okay, that was a crash. That's why they're stopping. A little bit of wet weather, can't stop. The school bus blocks the view. Both people can't see each other. I think number two is worse than number one. So you tell me which one you think. So I want you to vote. So vote on YouTube. This is worse than number one. Yes, that's a pedestrian he just hit. And yes, he's going to try to get out of the road. He's going to crawl. So here's number one. You tell me which one's worse, one or two. Yeah, it's a school bus. No one, I don't think there's any kids in it. You don't want to hit a school bus, but I still think number two. And this by far is probably the worst. They're going to show you both the northbound and the southbound view from the, um, from the camera. So here's, here's south. Yeah, definitely two. So watch the person running the red light right now. You got one car stopping and the other red car just barely missing the bus. So let's take a look from the other direction. You'll be able to see how far back the car that ran the red light was further back. They had more time. See the car way over to the left? He's stopping. He's got plenty of time. See, that car should stop. That's willfully running a red light. That's total disregard of the red light and what the consequences. So that's red light cameras. They are working. So just be aware that when you're in, a, in another state that uh, your picture may be taken and they're going to send that to you in the mail. Uh, crosswalks. Let's talk about pedestrians just for a moment. Pedestrians, when they're approaching a crosswalk, or stepping out off from the sidewalk onto the crosswalk, have the right of way. You should wait until they're fully across. But in UNH, I have the philosophy that they're adults. If they're halfway across, they're not coming back the other way. Then slowly um, move forward. All right. So if they're halfway across, you're not going to hit them. Then I'm going to let you go by. But be very careful about people coming towards you on a crosswalk and you think that they're, you're not going to hit them and you still cut in front of them. Um, I'm, I'm not happy about that. Um, so please. And driver's ed cars can get pulled over by the police. I know of people that have been teaching driver's ed. They've been pulled over for not yielding to pedestrians. Okay. Um, so just be aware. Yes, it can happen. Uh, bicycles in some cities have their own traffic lights. So bicycles, and we'll talk more about bicycles a little bit later, do have to follow the same traffic laws that cars do. But when they're in their bike lane in major cities, they're going to probably provide them with a traffic light like this. And this was a while back. So this was, you know, probably almost 10 years ago. There was 16 cities. I bet you we're almost double, triple that now. International signs, um, very important to know that shapes, colors, and symbols have stayed the uh, same, so it makes it somewhat easy to uh, follow traffic law. The biggest concern I want you to write down is um, what side of the road to drive on, and uh, yielding in roundabouts or circles can be very confusing. 
The other thing I want you to write down if you have a chance to drive internationally, and I think I spoke to, I don't know if it was someone from this class or another class recently, is that internationally they do not pull you over on the highway to give you a speeding ticket. They have that photo enforcement like we just saw with the red lights, and they mail it to you. I was over in Italy in October, and my son-in-law did most of the driving, and yes, he was given a ticket, but it was weeks, if not a month, after we had returned. Didn't even know that it happened. Doesn't even remember where or when, but he had a ticket that he had to pay. Okay, so it's not that hard to drive in another country. Um, I will just tell you personally, uh, just the way that I train you and the way that I drive, driving in Italy and some of the major uh, Italian cities was crazy. I mean, they get way too close. Um, they don't yield to anybody. They try to squeeze in. So it will definitely challenge you as a driver, but it's possible that you can drive, get your international designation on your license. I didn't have to take a test. I just had to apply for an international license and uh, through AAA before I went over and uh, I have that. Maybe I'll show it to you tomorrow. Um, but yeah, it was a lot of fun. So international science, pretty easy to figure out and to drive. Can you explain this sign? Seek alternative route. But Mr. Toll, it's spelled backwards. No, I took the picture in my side mirror. Now, why would I do that? Because things that you see in your mirror will be backwards. Think about that. Now, next time that you see an ambulance coming towards you, if you're a pedestrian, look at the front of the, the ambulance. Look at the spelling of the word ambulance. It's spelled backwards. The reason why it's spelled backwards is so that you can read it the correct way in your rearview mirror. So just as an experiment, do that. Um, spell the word ambulance backwards on a piece of paper, and next time you go out, put it in your rearview mirror so you can see it. Put it behind the driver's seat headrest in between the two headrests and see if it if it spells out correctly. That's why. Uh, the future of signs. This is something that is happening uh, over in Europe on cars. Um, I thought that um, you might want to see this. While driving, one passes so many traffic signs that sometimes even important information, such as speed limits or no overtaking signs, can get lost. The driver can also sometimes be distracted by traffic and not notice some of the signs. The Ford Traffic Sign Recognition System eliminates this issue by showing important traffic sign information in the instrument panel cluster. On display are speed limits and bans on overtaking, as well as their cancellation. The front camera records the traffic signs and transmits the respective data to the vehicle's traffic sign recognition system. The traffic sign recognition system uses an aging algorithm. This means that recently detected signs appear lighter. After a while, the color gets darker until the signs begin to gray out and finally completely disappear. This helps to make the driver aware of changes in real time. So that's the technology that we're, we're coming to in all vehicles. And we actually have something like that in the driver's ed vehicle. Uh, let's just talk a little bit about pavement markings. Um, four things I want you to write down. When it comes to the line that's to the left of the vehicle, the color tells you the direction of traffic. So write down in your notes, a yellow line to the left of you means two-way traffic. A white line to the left of you means one-way traffic. Same traffic in the same direction. The other two things I want you to write down, a solid line to the left of you means you cannot pass on that uh, over that line. And a broken line means passing is allowed, whether it be white or yellow. So a broken yellow is telling you people can pass in either direction. People coming towards you can pass, and you can pass. If it's a broken white line, then you have a lane that's to the left of you that can also pass.
the thing I want you to write down from all these different lanes here in Royal Road Passing, we just talked about with yellow and broken. The bottom right hand picture of shared turn lane, and it should be a shared left turn lane. So write that down. When you see a, a solid yellow line with a dotted yellow line, and then the same thing on the opposite side, that means any traffic that wants to make a left turn, whether traffic that is in your lane or the lane that's coming towards you, can both move over there and share that. The only thing I want you to remember about moving into that lane, make sure your entire vehicle is in that lane running parallel with the lines. You do not want to put your um, car into that area and still stick out in the back. And if someone else is coming towards you wanting to use that shared left turn lane, make sure you never get any closer than to about two car lengths. Because one person is going to have to eventually make their left hand turn first all right uh, the other thing I want to mention is please do not stop on crosswalks in town so if I drive with you in Durham or Dover and traffic is backing up and we've got a crosswalk please do not put any portion of your vehicle none of it front middle back none of it on the crosswalk give pedestrians a free passageway all the way across the road and always, as we said earlier tonight, make your stop at your stop line. Do not inch, inch, inch beyond on your first stop. Um, reversible lanes. I want you to realize that this is something that happens in a lot of cities. That we take what it looks like a shared left turn lane, but in reality it's not. Okay, that middle lane is only for getting into the city in the morning. Now, in your reading and responsible driving, there will be a green arrow pointing down at that lane. If for any reason you do not know what to do with that middle lane, stay out of it. Stay in the other two lanes. You'll be perfectly fine. In a metropolitan area, I always like driving in the far right lane because if I need to get off the road, I'm the closest lane to the exit that I want. You usually don't find exits to the left. So getting off the road or getting on is a lot easier being in the right lane. So at night, what's going to happen, we're going to change that middle lane. That's going to take you out of the city. So green arrow pointing down to that middle lane, it's active. You can use it. If there's a yellow flashing arrow, that means you can use it uh, temporarily, but then try to move out of it because it's going to change soon, whether it be soon as in time or soon as in where you're, the road is going to have a uh, oncoming cars coming towards you. And never go underneath a lane that has a red X. If you're driving on a multi-lane roadway and you're looking up at the traffic lights and there's an X that's red, get out of the lane as quickly as possible. Move to the right. Move to the right. Now, you probably won't see these unless you're in a metropolitan area and probably out west or down south. But we do have something like this in Massachusetts. It's called the zipper lane. Let's see if I can, if this comes up. All right, let me show you the zipper lane. So what's happening here is up ahead, I'm moving into the left lane. Notice the flashing light. Okay, now I'm in the zipper lane. That's that reversible lane. What they've done in Massachusetts is they put up these Jersey barriers. So I don't have to worry about any oncoming cars. Now, the only problem about traveling in this lane is what happens right now if you have a flat tire. Okay, you're basically stuck. The tow truck is going to have to come at you backwards to come get you to, to tow you out. There's not enough room to squeeze another vehicle here. The other problem about this lane is wonder if you want to take that exit that we see off to the right right now. You're just not going to be able to do it. So you're stuck until the very end of this. And this is just south of Boston. This is near Quincy. My daughter lived in Quincy for a while, so I was coming, uh, going down to visit. My wife was driving, so I decided I would just take my phone and, and take a picture. So it goes for probably about five, six miles. So make sure that when you go in, um, you don't have to get out right off. 
I don't know. Uh, I think it's because I gave a little bit of the uh, sign quiz to us early tonight, and I've talked a little bit longer than I normally do on certain subjects. So just like with turning, I'm starting to, to get backed up a little bit. So we're going to finish up on this topic tomorrow because uh, we still need to deal with um, um, school buses, trains, right of way, um, and we still didn't cover turning last night. So uh, the midterm, if you're looking at what you have for homework, it says that the um, midterm was going to be on the 9th. It will not. Okay, so we will not have the midterm this week. It's going to be next week. I think I'm going to put the dangers of speed and turning together. I'll try to finish up this section and get into stopping and speed tomorrow. So we'll be back online after Monday's class. So Monday will be parking with the midterm at the very end of class. So we'll do that. So that's what we're going to do. Uh, so there really isn't much for you to do for homework. Don't worry about chapter 12. You can do that after tomorrow's class. Don't do it coming into tomorrow's. You'll be fine with that. Oh, one last question. Let's see if you really uh, watch that video about uh, how traffic lights change. Let's see if you got this. You've got to text it on your phone, so don't put it in the YouTube uh, comments. They asked, "Is what is the name of of a group of cars going through a signal as a group called, okay? What is the name of the group of cars going through a signal as a group? What is that called, all right? Put that in your phone. Um, if you get it right, in the next uh, five, 10 minutes, I'll uh, maybe give you some type of extra credit on something or missing a homework assignment or something like that. Well, that's it for tonight. We'll see you tomorrow. Um, I think probably Thursday's class will do the scheduling for Saturday. I am going to leave some time. I think Friday's just about booked up. Um, but we'll definitely drive on Saturday. It's going to rain anyways. You guys don't want to drive in the rain the next couple of days. So we'll see you tomorrow, 8 o'clock. Have a good night, and we'll finish this up tomorrow.